Imagine flying inside a giant wing with luxury cabins and engine rooms accessible mid-flight. Discover the 1929 Marvel Junkers G38, a plane that changed aviation forever. Why did this airborne behemoth, once a commercial wonder, end up a World War II relic? Dive into its soaring journey and tragic end. First flown in 1929, the Junkers G38 was a startling sight. It was perhaps the ultimate expression of blended wing aircraft design during the interwar period, at least in terms of success. It was made when some aircraft designers predicted that blended wing or complete flying wing aircraft would be the future, with many passengers housed in these large wings instead of a fuselage. In 1929, this was a new hot idea to Hugo Junkers. 20 years earlier, he'd submitted a patent for a thick profile hollow wing design that could be used as a large commercial aircraft as early as 1909. The normal or usual aircraft design during this period could best be summarized as a flying crate, as the old saying goes. Most aircraft were thin-winged biplanes that relied on many wires and struts which, though effective, were not the most aerodynamic of designs. Junkers rejected this thinking, but wanted to bring forward the concept of a large cantilever metal wing that could provide the optimal ratio between lift and drag versus practicability due to its aerodynamically functional design and thickness. The First World War saw Junkers partly realize his dream of an internally held together aircraft with all metal wings, eliminating wires and struts that obstructed airflow. However, he was caught within the tight specifications issued by the military. He now had experience and made manufacturing facilities available after the war to realize his dream of a large commercial aircraft, but this time the Treaty of Versailles limited him. In 1920, development work began on the Junkers JG-1, a four-engine all-metal transport aircraft. Work on a prototype started in 1921. The fuselage's outer wing and rear parts were already constructed. This prototype was, however, discovered by the Allied Supervisory Board while inspecting this factory as part of their investigations. Work was stopped in its tracks, with demands for it to be scrapped. Undeterred, Hugo Junkers would draft designs during the 1920s, but would not truly attempt a serious design until the end of the decade, which led to the G38. As far back as 1927, under the cooperation of design engineer Ernst Zindel, work on project G40 initiated for a postal seaplane to be capable of making flights across the Atlantic. Junkers had also worked out a land-based version, the G-38, of which while the German Navy was more interested in the seaplane, Junkers, the very creator of this machine, favoured this improved land-based model, G-38, for its versatility, and he succeeded in getting funding from the Air Ministry to build it. From concept to finished prototype, work took a little over two years, and it was not until November 1929 that the first aircraft, designated D-2000, emerged from Junkers' Dessau plant from its first flight. On the 6th of November 1929, the G-38 was the largest land plane in service. Of course, the huge cantilever wing dominated the aircraft's appearance. It had a wingspan of 44 meters, which is a bit wider than that of a B-29 superfortress. The construction ought to sit on a series of tubular frames and struts bolted together and attached directly onto the fuselage to make production easier, as well as maintenance and transportation. The G-38 wing was divided into a central section, two intermediate sections and two outer sections. The structure was covered with classic stressed and ridged Duralumin sheets, the hallmark of many all-metal aircraft built in Germany in recent years. In addition to providing strong and effective protection, this metal helped absorb the twisting motion exerted on the wing. The wing was broad and thick at the root, joining the fuselage. It was 1.9 meters high. This is because it was designed as a lifting surface and a functioning section of the aircraft's internal structure. Like the Russian Kalinin K7 featured in a previous video, the G-38 wing's front inner sections were designed to accommodate people and equipment. Right up at the front, immediately adjacent to the fuselage and accessed via a passageway, were a pair of passenger cabins, offering commanding views through a series of curved windows. Further outboard from this cabin were the intermediate sections of the wing that mounted the engines. The forward portion of each section housed one engine. These consisted of two Junkers L55 V12 and two L8 inline six engines. The larger engines were mounted as the inward pair and the smaller as the outward pair. These provided 1,971 horsepower to the G38, 
with four blade propellers driven by the more powerful engines and two blade by the lesser. This gave this flying boat a maximum speed of 225 km per hour and a cruising speed of 180. But this segment of the vast wing housed not just the engines, but accommodated them in what might be called the aircraft equivalent of a ship's engine room. Entry was via a maintenance corridor that continued behind the wing passenger cabins and their respective passageway, which gave access to the engines for work during flight. Certainly not something that many aircraft then or now can boast. The corridor ran through most of the wing itself, and the wing could be accessible for inspection right up to almost the wing tips if engineers were okay with a tight crawl. The main fuel compartments were behind the passenger rooms and engine rooms on the leading edge of the wing, separated by a double firewall and a lot of metal. These comprised two tiers of petrol tanks, with a catwalk between them for inspection. Inboard this, and once more behind a double fireproof bulkhead, were ranged storage cabins containing the necessities of luggage and freights for passengers and crew. This was gained through the fuselage. There was also another luggage and freight holder located in the fuselage underside, as in a more traditional commercial aircraft. However, thick wings allowed reducing this space for better cabin overall space. As with the wing, the fuselage consisted of tubular struts and girder arcs covered by an all-metal skin. The pilots and co-pilots enjoyed an elevated position in a comfortable cabin above the nose. In front and slightly below them was a navigation room with two passenger seats right up in the front of the nose for those feeling extra adventurous. Immediately behind the cockpit was the chief mechanics post from which the whole power plant and fuel systems could be controlled. To the rear of this formerly situated the cabin crew and steward's room where meals and refreshments would be prepared, and adjacent to this room was located a small lavatory. Further behind this were two more spacious passenger cabins and one for smoking. Accommodation for passengers was designed to be palatial, aspiring to complete with Zeppelins, these prestigious carriers of German commercial aviation at the time. As with most Junkers aircraft designed around this time frame, the G38's control surfaces extended along the full span of the wing's trailing edge and were divided into two sections. This allowed the inner section to be operated as flaps, while the outer section operated as ailerons. Tail control surfaces were arranged in a biplane style with three vertical rudders. This was done in response to drag consideration. If a single large rudder had been used, the drag force of the tail wing would have been too great to be manually countered. All the control surfaces were dynamically balanced to reduce flutter, and reports from the test flight praised the G38 for its easy handling characteristics. Controls of the G38 were said not to feel any more difficult than those of the far smaller Junkers F13 and G31, which was saying quite a lot for such a bulky aircraft. All metal with thick wings and four engines, this could never be lightweight. The empty weight was 13 tons, while the maximum weight at takeoff could be as much as 21 tons. All this mass was supported by a main landing gear with four large wheels arranged in pairs, one behind the other, to improve comfort and handling on the ground. These wheels could turn horizontally and were held in place with springs. The landing gear was fixed and covered, shock absorbers were built into vertical frames. This landing gear had at one time been covered with an aerodynamic fairing that was removed to reduce weight, but placed back on another in the interests of appearance. Shortly after the first flight, the G-38 was purchased by the Air Ministry, with the plan to have it flown to Lufthansa. The airplane then underwent a series of testing and demonstration flying that drew some interest. On the 30th of November 1930, test pilots Zimmermann and Schnitzinger flew the aircraft to set various world records for speed and altitude with five five-ton payloads. The flight tests were completed with a circumnavigation of Europe, which contributed greatly to whipping up enthusiasm for Junkers and new aircraft, and then it was formally handed over to the Lufthansa, based in Berlin. It began flying a commercial route between London and Berlin. Barely had it started flying this route when it was decided that the G38 needed modification. The recent press tours had put the demand for this aircraft at an all-time high, and passenger capacity of just 13 started to seem too small. The engines were upgraded, going up through four L88 V12s, which upped the power from 1,971 horsepower to 3,100, and all of them now drove four-blade propellers. The aircraft had been retrofitted to increase the passenger cabins, increasing the carrying capacity to allow up to 30 passengers and their cargo. This refit was completed in the summer of 1932, and the aircraft took to the skies once more. Lufthansa also commissioned building a second aircraft, which would be given the designation D2500. From the first, this was designed based on lessons learned from the prototype, 
yet it had a full two-deck fuselage, and its wing cabins expanded to a total passenger capacity of 34 passengers. This new aircraft also gave most passengers in its central fuselage a view of the outside world, which wasn't included in the prototype. This aircraft entered service at about the same time the first refit was completed, and together they began commercial service. G38s very soon acquired an excellent reputation for comfort and luxury. Passengers could move freely during flight and were waited on by efficient staff. Though their passenger capacity was relatively small, given the imposing size of the aircraft, it was soon ensured that it became the pride of Lufthansa and German flying. In 1933, D2500 had been christened by Marshal Hindenburg after the then President Hindenburg. In 1934, both aircraft returned for another refit, receiving all new engines in the form of inline six cylinder Jumo 4s, with the latest total power coming out at 4,023 horsepower. Sadly, the G38A would not even live beyond 1936. It crashed during takeoff while on a workshop flight from Dessau due to incorrectly connected cables. The pilot survived, but the airplane was damaged and beyond repair. Even though it could have been repaired, it was beyond the reasonable value, especially since the airplane type was becoming outdated by the mid to late 1930s, as newer and larger commercial aircraft came into service in Germany and elsewhere. Teams in G38E service continued to fly regularly airline routes from Lustanza until World War II began. It was then repainted with wartime camouflage and returned to military transport duty. Through the Greek army campaign, it would often cruise to ferry troops and supplies. On the 17th of May 1941, it was however destroyed during a raid by British bombers. There had been thought of a militarized version of the G38 used with the Luftwaffe. Actually, Junkers had assigned itself the task of designing such an aircraft under the designation K-51, but nothing came out of it, at least not in Germany. Japanese interest in the G38 design dates back to 1928, and Japan was the first to ask Junkers for this type of conversion to turn the G38 into a bomber. The design was licensed to Mitsubishi in April of 1930, with a team from Junkers going overseas to support further developments in Japan. It was developed into the Type 92, more famous as the K-20. From 1933 to 1935, six of them were built by Mitsubishi. The power plants for these aircraft were four Jumo 204s. Their maximum speed was 200 km per hour, and they could carry up to five tons of bombs. Moreover, for a bomber of this generation, they were mostly unusually very well defended. The five machine guns in various positions and a 20mm dorsal cannon. When first operated, they were the greatest offensive aircraft fielded by Japan. They were surrounded by secrecy. By the height of the Second World War, they had become hopelessly obsolete and were only ever used as transports. Unfortunately, none of these airplanes exist today, all having been destroyed in one form or another, usually involving explosions. Thanks for watching. What did you think of the Junkers G38? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more fascinating aviation stories. See you in the next one.